So let's move on and go into preparing for the build. So preparing a host system. So the host system is the system that I'm running at the moment. It's the Raspberry Pi operating system. This is the system that's going to host the building of our new Linux from scratch operating system. So it says in this tool, uh, in this chapter, the host tools needed for building LFS are checked and if necessary installed. Then we'll create a partition on a disk and we'll create the partition itself, create a file system on it and mount it. And this is quite an important chapter. If you go to my channel, you'll see I've got a playlist with various uh, videos which show host system requirements for different hosts, so different uh, other different um, Linux distributions that can be used as hosts as examples of what packages need to be installed because a lot of um, distributions don't come with all the packages that are required to start building a Linux from scratch system and in fact ra the ras Raspberry Pi operating system is no exception probably because it's built on ultimately Debian I think so um, it, these are the minimum packages we, we need so it's quite a small selection of packages there that are needed to build Linux from scratch um, but they are needed so you can't say oh well, I haven't got patch installed that doesn't matter we don't really need that you will need it uh, take it from me uh, you cannot get away without um, one of these packages and to help check whether we've got these packages they've got a little script here to run in. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split the screen into two. Um, I'm going to put my browser here and in fact I'll make the text a little bit bigger. Should have done it earlier on really. Uh, just make it a bit easier to read. Don't want to make it too big because um, you start getting things wrapping around and it gets awkward to copy and paste stuff so I think it was quite a reasonable size to start off with but um, we'll see let's maybe leave it at that for the moment and first thing I need after that is a terminal so there's our terminal we're going to be using the terminal a lot and I'll just put that there next to that so what will happen is that I'll copy commands from the browser from the book and paste them into the terminal and the advantage of that is not only is it quicker it saves making any mistakes it's still possible to make mistakes copying and pasting you might miss the first or last character of what you're copying it's something I've done um, so you still have to take care but it's a lot better than typing in which is how I used to do it um, first of all when I was learning about Linux I didn't know you could do things like copying and pasting and there was only the actual terminal when the machine booted up for had a GUI and everything and uh, yeah it was uh, quite long winded and prone to errors so next thing I'll do is to make the font bigger on this terminal as well right, I can't, that doesn't seem to work from the keyboard so I'll have to Shift Control Plus, yeah, that's what I'm doing. It doesn't seem to be working, unfortunately. So I'll just make this a bit bigger. Now, one thing I don't want to do is to I want to keep the number of columns at least at 80 because there's one point where we use a piece of software that needs 80 columns visible. So as long as I've not stretched this too much, made this too big. Um, right, yeah, it's 80, so that's okay. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I won't stretch this all the way down because I have had somebody mention, I've not really thought about this, about when they're viewing the videos that the subtitles come up and also I suppose you can get the time bar appearing at the bottom if you're moving the cursor around over the video and I can't read what's what's typed at the bottom of the screen so I'm going to leave that terminal just above the bottom of the screen there so that when the scroll um, when the uh, prompt gets to the bottom of the terminal 
that is still visible behind any um, automatically produced subtitles. I'm also going to adjust the scroll back because sometimes I'm hoping I won't need it, but sometimes if I need to scroll back, um, let's set this to some ridiculously big number. It's not going to let me. Okay. Right, is my keyboard going to sleep? Is that why it's not working? Yeah, looks like I've gone to sleep. Okay. Uh, I'll just put some ridiculous number in there and see what it takes. Okay, so 100,000 so is not too bad. So I've just increased the scroll back there with edit preferences. And what it means, and it was under a no display, wasn't it? That's it. And all it means is when stuff's scrolling through, if I need to look back at something, there's less chance of it being lost at the end of the scroll buffer. Uh, it could be quite annoying if you can't scroll back to look at something. So anyway, so the first thing I'm going to do, well, the very first thing I'm going to do is become root because a lot of these commands we're going to be running uh, will need uh, super user access. Now this actually doesn't need super user access, um, but it's going to be useful to have this around, um, or it could be useful later on. Um, so what I'm going to do is do sudo su minus, and what this does, su is to become super user. If you use super user and minus, you need the um, super user's password. We don't have the super user's password, so we do sudo, which is uh, a permission that's been granted to a normal user, which is what we are in green, um, which allows us to elevate our privileges to run equivalent commands that the root would be able to use. One of those commands is the su command, so we can circumvent having to know the root's password by running this, and all it'll do is it will just give us root access straight away. So as I say, if I try to do su minus, it asks for the root's password. Don't know it. It may not even be set. So if we use this command, we can become root straight away. And as you can see, the, the prompt color has changed just to indicate that we're um, not a normal user anymore. So from now on, uh, as a super user, you've got to be very careful what commands you type in. Uh, you can quite easily damage the system that you're running. Um, so just uh, read and take care of what you're doing. So to copy this, just highlight it as you would do normally. While I'm holding down the left button, I can use the scroll, the mouse scroll wheel to scroll the page because it doesn't fit on the screen. Now I've highlighted it. Normally with Windows, you do right click and you get a menu and you paste. You can do that here. But with Linux, you've got an additional facility where if you centre click, so just click the mouse button, it pastes everything that you've highlighted. So you've got to bear in mind what you've last highlighted, because obviously if I did something else in another window, then that buffer that's copied stuff for the centre click paste gets updated. And although this will still be highlighted, that's not what's in the buffer anymore. So you have to bear in mind... Um, another thing, sometimes highlighting won't fill the paste buffer, so I could right click and paste and it might paste something different to what I thought was in the buffer, so it's something else to bear in mind. But generally, this is a lot faster than having to call up a context menu and clicking again. And as you can see, it's copied everything, it's copied the last command, and all I need to do now is to press enter to run that script. And you can see it's run. And what it's done, it's shown us several programs that are missing. Um, and if we just go through here, it tells us um, also what, what the expectations are. So you can see for Bash 3.2, which is the minimum version required, bin, .sa, uh, bin slash sh should also be a symbolic link or hard link to Bash. And if you look here, the first line under the version number, so the version number is 5.03, that's fine because the minimum is 3.2, but the second line it says bin sh is pointing at bin dash, so that's not good, we need to change that, and to change that we use a command called ln, 
use a switch S minus S F V. So the S is we want to create a symbolic link, which is like a soft link. Um, F is to force uh, any overwriting of an existing link, which there is, and V is verbose to show us what's happening. And we want a link slash bin slash bash to slash bin slash sh. And you can see it's told us that it's created a sim link bin sh, and it's going to it's now pointing to bin bash. So you can see it's the same format as what we've got here, but instead of dash. It's using bash. So now, if I rerun that command, bash version check at version check sh, and we look at the top of the file, uh, top of the output. Sorry, you can see the version is there again. But now we've got what we expect. Bin sh is pointed to bin bash. So that's that first bit fulfilled. So all we need to do now is just go through each one of these, just check the versions, and if there's anything missing, we'll install that package. Um, by the way, I've got everything up to date on the uh, Raspberry Pi operating system. So uh, to do that, I did apt update. And you can see it uh, goes to the repositories and checks stuff. Everything's up to date. So uh, if there isn't anything, if it hasn't updated, it should do, because I believe it checks uh, for updates every time you boot the machine. So it should be up to date. But um, if you do need to, uh, if there is packages there to upgrade, then you can just do apt upgrade and it will pull in those packages. So you can see there's nothing there new to install. It says I've got some packages which I can remove, uh, which are automatically installed, but um, I'm not going to bother with them. So yes, the, everything's up to date. So all I need to do is install anything that's missing. So if we move on to, we've done the bin sh link, is done, so move on to bin utils. We need any version greater than 2.25, we've got 2.31, so that's fine. Then it says bison is missing, so we need to install bison. So we do apt install bison, and you can see it's saying that um, it's suggesting, well actually this is the package we've, got, we've requested to be installed. It's going to install a few other packages. Um, incidentally, one of them is um, M4 and you can see M4 hasn't been found. So by installing packages individually, one at a time, it just saves us a little bit of work uh, when we go down doing this. We could do one big install, but why, why do that? Why, why go down? Just do one bit at a time. It's it's usually better when you're uh, trying to work things out if you do one little bit at a time rather than trying to do everything because you don't really know what's causing errors. Certainly if you get errors, you might get multiple errors when compiling packages and you think they've all got to be fixed. Generally what happens is it's the first error that needs to be fixed. The subsequent errors have been caused by that one error. So when you fix that first error, all the other errors disappear because they were reliant on that first error being fixed. And same thing with anything else I found with uh, uh, software. Just fix the first thing, redo what you're doing, and see what else has been fixed by that first fix you've done. Um, it just keeps things more logical, keeps keeps a bit of sanity in your head. So, as I say, M4 is being pulled in. It's also pulling in some other packages, um, these two here. And it's suggesting other packages look like they're documentation packages. We don't need them. So I'll just press enter there to accept the default. And there it is installing the packages. And now we can recall this version check command. And you can see it's installed Bison 3.3.2. We need 2.7, so that's more than enough. And it's also installed this symlink as well, which wasn't there before either and it says we need that as well so that's good and if we just quickly look down to M4 you can see M4 is not missing now because that got pulled in when Bison was pulled in so if we carry on with bzip2 it needs uh, version 1.04 1 1.0.4 we've got 1.0.6 that's fine core utils we need 6.9 we've got 8.30 
diffy tools you need 2.8.1 we've got 3.7 so these are all good all newer packages as you'd expect as we're up to date uh, find your tools 4.2.31 got 4.6.0.225 Gork we need 4.0.1 um, where's it gone there it is there right Gork command not found so we need to install that one so let's do the same as we did for Bison just install Gork and that's done we we'll call the script and now you can see we've got GNU Orc 4.2.1 um, yep that's fine because um, we need Gork 4.0.1 so that's newer so that's good and we've now got a symlink as well user bin Orc pointing to user bin Gork so that's that's good as well that's been uh, done automatically as well for us next we've got the compiler GCC and we need 6.2 uh, Raspberry Pi has come with 8.3 so it's not the latest but that's not a problem it's it's new enough and also the C++ compiler is the same version so that's good glibc, glibc never comes up obviously as it does here um, normally it comes up with some cryptic number and some cryptic message uh, that you have to infer that it's glibc you're looking at but this actually says glibc so that's good makes it nice and easy we need 2.11 we've got 2.28 so that's fine next grep we need 2.5.1a we've got 3.3 gzip we need 1.3.12 we've got 1.9 linux kernel we need 3.2 we've got version 5 so that's Way, way more. So that's good. M4s, you see, it's just been pulled in. We need 1.4.10. We've got, we've got 1.4.18, so that's fine. Make, we need 4.0, we've got 4.2. Patch, we need 2.5.4, we've got 2.7.6. Pearl, we need 5.8.8, .8. we've got 5.28, that's fine. Python, we need 3.4, we've got 3.7. Said we need 4.1.5, we've got 4.7. Tar, we need 1.22, and we've got 1.30, so that's okay. Text info 4.7, right now, although it doesn't say text info, it's this make info, command not found, is, is what's missing. So, what's happened here is make info is the program name that's not been found, but text info is the package, so we don't do when we install this package we don't do apt install make info because as I say that's not the package name it's only one of the programs that's being run that's inside the package the actual package name is the name that's given in the Linux or scratch book so we need to install text info and you can see that pulls in a load of libraries Let's press enter to accept that. And that's installed, so let's recall the script. Yep. And you can see if we go down to the uh, text info, it says GNU text info, and we've now got 6.5, which is way more than 4.7, so that's great. And last of all, we've got XZ 5.0.0, we've got 5.2.4, and the last thing it does, it checks the um, C compiler. Uh, which is G++ and that compiles OK so that's all quite promising um, there's an important box out there which says that um, the sim links are important so don't ignore them um, 
I have to say, if you deviate from the book or or even deviate from what I'm showing here on on these videos, then you're really on your own because um, if you go looking for help and you've done something a little bit different, uh, it can be the case of well, you, you veered from the book. You know, we can't really help because we don't know what effect um, it's had that you've stayed away from the book. So try and stick as closely to the book as possible and and also what I'm showing, although I might deviate from the book a little bit, um, what I do is, uh, is something that I know that is not going to cause a problem, or if it does, I'll, I'll warn, warn about that, uh, what effect, what different effects it will have. So now it's going to go through the different chapters. Um, let's say these are different parts of the book and different sections we're going to um, do to prepare for the actual building of the system. So let's move on. Right, so we're going to creating a new partition. Um, and it says like most other operating systems, Linux from scratch is usually installed on a dedicated partition. Um, now you could install this into a directory on the root file system. Um, Depending on the size of your SD card, you may or may not be able to do that. Uh, this one's got 5.6 gig available. I think that might be a bit tight. Um, off the top of my head, I think the minimum you'll need is 8 gigabytes for a successful install. So um, I haven't got enough to do that. Um, as I say, you may want to do that. There are several ways actually of installing Linux and Scratch and Raspberry Pi. Um, several ways depending on how you want to use it, I guess. Uh, one way would be, as I say, to install it on a on a in a partition on the same on the root file system as the host. Um, <clears throat> that would be per perfectly feasible. Um, I want to show how to set up the bootloader, it would just be a simple case of uh, pointing the uh, route to a different location. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to do that, There's, I wouldn't normally do that anyway because you really want an operating system to be separate from its host. Um, so you may just want to do that just to go through the experience of building it without actually having something you can actually use. That may be a possibility. Um, but what I shall be doing is I'm going to be installing it onto an external disk. Um, it's actually a, uh, one of these docking systems I've got with a, a little laptop drive plugged into it. So it's just I've only done that because it's faster than the SD card. If I did have enough space, I'd do it anyway. Um, but with that, because it will be on a separate external disk, uh, I've got two options then. I can either put the boot system on the disk and have no need for the SD card whatsoever, or I could keep the existing boot uh, um, partition that is on the SD card and just modify it to decide whether I want to boot the um, Raspberry Pi operating system on the SD card or um, point it to the external disk. So there's two options there. Um, what I will do is I'll create space for a separate boot partition on the external disk um, and I'll show both ways of booting um, when, when we come to that point. So I'll make room on the disk now when we do the partitioning but I won't actually do anything with that partition until I come to show the method for boot, booting solely off the um, disk without the need for the SD card. And in fact, if you do use that method, it does mean in theory that you'll be able to take that drive or USB flash card away and stick it into another Raspberry Pi and boot from that. Um, so that that would be quite useful without without needing to rely on the um, uh, an additional SD card. So if that doesn't make too much sense at the moment, hopefully it will do when we come around to it. But as I say, you, you can um, install into a subdirectory, but I won't be doing that at all. 
Now it says here that it needs a minimum of 10 gigabytes. I'm, I'm pretty sure I found that 8 gigabytes is the absolute minimum, but that is tight. Um, so that's important to know. Um, and it advises 30 gig partition size for reasonable growth. So that means if you want to add other packages, like if you do want to go onto the um, BLFS book and install additional packages. So that's something else to bear in mind. Um, it mentions about swap space, so if there's not enough RAM uh, to create a partition for swap space, which we'll be doing, by default the Raspberry Pi uses a swap file on the SD card. Uh, there's two issues with that. One, the SD card is slow, and two, uh, swap files are slow because they've obviously got to go through the filing system, so they're probably not that noticeably slower, but there will be um, a performance here, you know, maybe 5% extra work needs to be done um, because it's a file rather than a partition. So I'll be creating a swap partition on the disk and I'll be turning off this swap file and just using the one on disk solely just for speed. In actual fact, there's enough memory on the Raji Pi that I don't think the swap partition is needed at all, um, but it's always useful to have a swap partition just in case you do start to run out of memory you'll see the disk thrashing away it's a good early warning um, yeah there's uh, it says here about how to partition the disk well it's down to you really how you want it laid out um, again it mentions the size of the root partition um, then it goes on about the swap, how much swap do you need, again that's a bit of a moot point. The, um, in previous years when memory was limited and it was slower, uh, it was always advised to create larger swap partitions. These days you probably don't need a big part, uh, swap partition. However, saying that, um, Linux uses swap partitions when it hibernates, so if you've configured your system to hibernate in any way, um, what Linux does, it copies the memory to the swap partition because obviously the swap partition is not being used when it's being hibernated. Um, so in that case, you need to make sure the swap partition is as big as, at least as big as, the um, amount of memory you've got. So for example, if I wanted to use hibernation on this Raspberry Pi, the minimum size swaps, uh, swap partition I'd need is four gigabytes because that's how much memory it's got but other than that it would be a waste to put aside that much disk space for a swap um, you probably don't I'd say minimum of 256 megabytes and maybe half a gig or even a gigabyte is way more than enough um, give you plenty of room to maneuver if you did run out of memory now it mentions a grub BIOS partition um, this is if you've created this with a GPT table. Um, I'm just going to be sticking with a traditional um, MS-DOS partition. Keeps things simpler. There is no UEFI boot um, on the Raspberry Pi. In fact, it's not a normal boot in the terms of a, a PC because it's uh, effectively a mobile device. You could arguably say a Raspberry Pi is a mobile phone um, just with a few um, customized uh, ports on it you know for example the USB ports and so on and the video ports uh, but effectively that's what it is uh, therefore it boots differently it, it, it the way it boots is it looks for its boot partition which is a, a VFAT formatted partition and it looks for specific files that it knows about and it's it's able to read the file system itself without any need for loading drivers or anything it's it's like integral into the way it works um, so there's no need for grub so therefore we will not be installing grub it's it's unnecessary um, and it could, I, I guess it would probably get in the way of how the Raspberry Pi boots um, so we won't be using grub <coughs> Um, this part here mentions that you can put these directories on different, or not that you can, that it's usual in certain cases to put these directories in 
Uh, the, yeah, these directories in different partitions. Um, won't be doing that. The only one that will be different is boot for what I said. The Raspberry Pi boots in a particular way. Therefore, it does need a separate boot partition to be able to boot successfully. Um, so, but generally, for if you're building Linux from scratch for the first time, or generally in a normal system, you probably wouldn't need separate directories um, or separate partitions on these directories. And it does make things a little bit more complicated as well. So my advice is um, not to do that, especially the first time round. So creating the file system partition. So they've not given any details about how to partition the, your disk. They've left that to you, or probably because, as, as it said on that page, there's arguments about what's best. There's probably no best way. It's probably what's best for you. That's probably the only best way, actually. Um, but I'm going to show you what I would do for this. Um, be the simplest and more straightforward, most straightforward way of doing it. So what I'm going to do, first of all, I've obviously got my disk plugged in already uh, is if you do F disk minus L that will list all the disks that are attached um, ignore these dev RAM devices they're just um, RAM devices that uh, the Raspberry Pi uses the two that you, you are interested in are these two at the bottom here so we've got one called dev MMC BLK0 and one called dev SDA now in a normal Intel based x86 machine Dev SDA is the first disk. As I say, this device is like a mobile device, um, so it's slightly different. It boots from an SD card, and that's what this device is. So this is actually the first device. This is the boot device. Um, you can see the partition type is a DOS type, MS DOS type, and we've got two partitions on here. The first one is the boot partition, and as you can see, it's well, you can't see it's formatted as a, a FAT32, but that's the type that's been set because that's what it is actually formatted as. And the second one is the Linux operating system, which is the system you can see here, this, this one here, uh, that. So everything off this route is held within that partition. And as you can see, this dev SDA, which is my external drive, it's got no... Um, partitioning details at all so what I need to do is to run fdisk on my external drive so I just type in fdisk dev sda in fact when you're doing any operations like this with disks it's safest to copy and paste to save any typos in case you erase or format or change the working system so this um, is the disk layout. You can see it's got, now these, this is funny, these optimal bytes here, I think this is the external docking bay that does this. Um, it seems to do that for some reason, I'm not sure why. And it probably means I'm gonna get some errors coming up um, as, to, as regards partitions not being on boundaries. Um, so hopefully you won't get these errors as I say I think it's because of the docking station I'm using um, so I'm going to see if I can ignore them but the first thing I want to do is I want to create that boot partition that I say I'm going to use eventually I'm not going to use it initially but eventually I will be using it so what I need to do is do n for new <clears throat> I want to have a primary partition so just press enter first partitions one and first sector I'll accept the default and if we just look back because it's now asking what the last sector is it wants to know how big the partition is so let's make it the same size as the existing one you can see the existing one on the SD card is 256 megabytes so rather than um, worry about what sector that is all I can do or all I need to do is do plus to say you want to extend it by 256 megabytes and press enter and you can see it says it's created a new partition one of type Linux and size 256 meg so if I do P to print out the partition table yes yeah, it's, it's already come up saying it does not start in the physical sector boundary um, 
ignore that for the moment. Um, that shouldn't happen to you. Um, yeah, I'll just carry on, just ignore those for the moment. And then what I'll do, I'll go offline, I'll fix my partitions and then come back. But for, for the moment, just ignore that. So the next thing I want to do is uh, I need some swap space and I need uh, some space for the root partition. So swap space, because this is a spinning disk, swap space is best to go at the beginning of the disk where the transfer rates are, are faster because basically the disk is spinning faster on the outside where the allocations start than it is on the inside. So it's always best to put the swap space early on in the, in the disk. So that's the next partition that I'll create. So do N for new partition, press enter for another primary, press enter for the next available one, which is two, press enter for the first sector, and decide how big you want the swap space to be. So I'm going to create a one gigabyte swap partition. So I do plus one G, probably way more than I need, but this is a 500 gigabyte drive. There's plenty of space on it. So it's created a partition to type Linux, and you can see the size is 1024 meg, which is the same as one gigabyte. And yeah, ignore the errors again, like I say. So you can see I've got 256 megabyte for the boot partition and one gigabyte for the uh, swap. So I'm going to create another partition, which is now going to be my um, root partition. So this is where the file system will reside, the new Linux from scratch file system. First sector, um, yeah, we'll just accept that. And then I've got to decide how big the partition going to be. If I want a specific size, I'll just do, say, plus 10 gigabytes. As simple as that. What I'm going to do is use all the remainder of the disk. So all I need to do is just press Enter. And you can see it's used the rest of the disk, 460-odd gigabytes. Do P, and you can see there's the three partitions now the one problem is we've got it says these are only labels it's not actually how the partitions formatted that's something we need to do in a moment um, we need to just um, change those types so that when we come to look at these they are accurate so what we do is you do T for type partition let's do partition one first of all and you can type L to list all the codes to find out what what uh, we need to format the boot partition as. Uh, the best way to do this is to scroll back, see what type it is, and you can see it's type C. So we'll replicate that exactly. So just type C there, and if you look on this list C, you can see Windows 95 FAT32 or the LBA. And you can see it's changed it from Linux to Windows 95 FAT32 LBA. As I say, it's just a label. It's all it's done is change that label so that when we look at it, we can see straight away how it's either supposed to be formatted or either how it is formatted. So now we've got to do the same to the second partition. So we do T again. Second partition, because this is going to be our swap partition, and we want to change it to a Linux swap partition, which is 82. You can see 82 Linux swap. So let's type in 82. And you can see it's changed partition type Linux to Linux swap slash Solaris. So now we do P, and this is how we want it laid out. We've got our 256 megabyte partition, which is going to be formatted with FAT32. We've got a 1 gigabyte um, swap partition, and we've got approximately 460 gigabytes, which is going to be our root system. So what I'll do is I'll put the video on pause and I'll just change these sector sizes so that I don't get these warnings um, just to ensure that I'm getting the best performance and then I'll resume recording and carry on. Okay, so um, as you can see I've fixed those um, partition errors. Um, the problem is, is the IO I guess it's the IO buffer of the um, external drive docking station has got an optimal buff uh, yeah, buffer size, IO buffer size of 
um, through this number here. Basically, it's three two seven six five. I think it was. Um, it's not a number that's divisible. It's not a binary number. Basically, it's divisible by two, or even if divisible by two. It's kind of strange. So what I've had to do is create partitions um, that have got gaps in them. Basically, you can see this partition ends at five nine five eight nine eight one four, but it starts at five nine five eight nine eight two four. So there's like ten sectors missing in between these two partitions, and likewise with um, the end of this one ends in nine three four, but starts at nine seven six. So it's kind of strange why it's like this unusual number um, but anyway the errors aren't there anymore so I can just write those changes and come out and um, we can carry on now with actually creating the file systems so the first thing I'll need to do is I'll create the, um, like I say, I'm not going to worry about the boot partition at the moment. Um, I'll do that when um, I'm showing the two ways that um, you can boot the external drive from. So the initial way I'm going to show, which doesn't involve the boot partition, is I'm going to use the boot partition on the Raspberry Pi's SD card. So that's why I don't need to format that at the moment. Um, but I'll need to... Um, create a file system on the root and we use this command here so make file system and I need to type in the name of the file system so it's dev sda3 because that's our root and press enter there and that's done. So we can't look at that at the moment because it's not mounted but it says it's finished that's fine. So the next thing we need to do is to make a swap partition and swap partition is the second one here so we'll just do that and that's quick that just rides the signature it doesn't do any formatting or checking or anything. So those are the two partitions that we're initially going to use set up Let's move on so setting the LFS variable so they use this environment variable LFS um, because this is going to be the root location of the mounted partition on the host file system um, and it does say to check whenever you're entering or leaving the environment and you'll see me check it every now and then because if you don't have this set, it will default to zero and there's one point where you could actually trash the host system if, if this uh, environment variable is not set. So that is important to have. Um, yeah, there's one thing here, it does say you could set this in your bash profile, so I might do that just in case. Um, so I'm going to modify the roots because I'm roots at the moment. Uh, just do port slash root. Right, there isn't a bash profile at the moment. Let's have a look at the bash RC. Just a bash profile, that's what they recommend. So I'll just put that command in there. I want to do and I'm going to come out of being the root, go back in and just check to see if that's actually been set or not and it has so that's good so it means that whenever I log into the root now on the host system that 
variable will be set for me so even when I check it if I have any doubts it should it should be there and that will save any mistakes so now we're going to mount in the partition so if I just get the partition layout up again just to remind us that the root is the SDA3 partition and swaps the SDA2 so first of all we make a directory using that environment variable where we can mount the partition and you'll notice although these grey boxes have got several commands in I don't just copy the whole lot I do one at a time the reason is I want to see check the output of each command if I do the whole lot it's going to be easy, a bit more difficult to go through and check the output of each one so I just do one command at a time and just check what the output is to make sure it's worked so our root partition as I've said is SDA3 so just type SDA3 there and that's been mounted so now we can actually look at that uh, directory and you can see there's nothing on there apart from the usual lost and found directory and if you are using um, separate partitions for some of the new directories like user then it says to do this here do this extra commands. Um, it says here's a warning assuming you're not going to be restarting the computer throughout the LFS pro process. If you shut down your system, you either need to remount the LFS partition each time you restart the building process or modify the FS tab file to automatically remount it on boot. So we could do that to make sure that it's always there. Although, bear in mind if you reboot this. Raspberry Pi without the external drive plugged in then you might get an error or something um, strange might happen so that's worth bearing in mind but let's modify the FS tab so that if um, do shut down which you know, might do I'll go to bed tonight um, then that partition will be automatically mounted so if you remember oops, it's SDA three. So in theory if I just do you mount dollar LFS it should unmount the drive the partition sorry you can see there's nothing there now and if I do mount it's mounted it because it's in the file system table so that's working okay and likewise with the swap on we can turn that on if we just do sbin swap on you'll see that's the swap file already in use that's on the SD card so I'm going to disable that but first I'll enable the one we've got on the external drive um, SDA2 that's on so if we look at that now you can see it's it's been added to this list and now I'm going to use swap off to remove, not actually delete the file, but remove it from use. So now if I do swap off, swap on, you can see the only um, swap device I've got is a partition, which is faster than the file, and it's on the external drive, which is going to be faster than the SD drive. And again, I could, in theory, add that to um, the FS tab. Wherever it is. Right, let's search for FS tab. There it is. So it'll be slash dev slash SDA2. Um, swap swapped so the swap location should be swap the swap type it's a swap defaults zero now the only thing is that if I do swap off minus a that should oops, that should remove all the swaps yeah, it has done. 
but when I do swap on minus eight amount all the swaps because of obviously that wasn't in the FS tab the default Oh, it has worked actually. Oh, right, okay. I thought that was going to do uh, the file, and obviously it hasn't. Maybe it's because it's found as a partition. It's going to do that, or the, the fact that it's been specified in the FS tab. I thought it was going to mount the file system as well, but it hasn't, so that's good. So that means every time I boot, it's um, assuming I've got the external drive plugged in, it will be using the partitions on that drive. So just to recap, I've got the new root file system which is currently empty mounted on the LFS MNT LFS location and you can see it's mounted it's empty and I've got the partition which is also an external drive which is set to be used if we need it very unlikely it might use a couple of K sometimes a little bit does get used um, of the swap device uh, but nothing significant will be required um, when we're building